That's scary. No, well, welcome in. We're glad to have everyone, I think. Yeah, even her. We're glad to have everybody. Uh, so as we get started, I know this isn't going to apply to all. Actually, several it, it won't here, and that's fine. That's good. Uh, but I was just thinking back a few years when I was prepping for this lesson, and it reminded me of, of our new church building and whenever we moved into it. I'm trying to look around. Is there? I don't think there are any originals tonight, if I'm not mistaken, to the old building, whenever it was you know, the first time we had worship in it. I wasn't here for that one either. Uh, but I still remember this, for the, and I know several of you do also. Uh, for those who were here, the, the first time we had worship in this facility, wh what would you say about it? How did you feel? I mean, what was the environment like? Okay, I bet you were. Hold on just a second. I was going to say... I was going to say that, uh, Nick, what smell stood out to you? He's really keen in the sense. I know that. <laughs> now, uh, Marty, you were very nervous. I don't doubt that. Yeah, you and me both, especially you, I'm sure. But, no, but what else? For those who are here on that, raise your hand, by the way, if you were here. I'm not going to say you have to talk. The first time we had worship in this building. Okay. Oh, three. All right. So, Marty, talk. Thank you. It felt strange because we were farther apart when we started. Yeah, that's different. That's, nice. that's true. <laughs> She doesn't like getting too close to people, if you haven't noticed. So. Yeah. Yeah. It is it's a lot different. Light. And I still love that. Oh, the brightness. Even, yeah, even in the middle of, of winter, on a Wednesday night, it's just like, it's just so bright in here. That's really nice. Um, on my end, I, w I won't speak for everyone else. I haven't heard this one yet. I, I was just super excited, really, all the way around. It was different, you know, and, and it's new. Uh, but it's really neat, and, and we spent that Sunday, you know, lesson-wise, and we had, like, special leadings of songs also in our, our prayers. We kind of looked at it almost as like, um, I mean, first and foremost, it's just a day of worship to God, uh, just a day. I mean, his special day. So we're giving that to him. But uh, it was also really special, that worship day, because it's almost like we're, we're dedicating what's his to him, and we just want to use it to the best of his service for his honor. Well, that's what's going on tonight in 1 Kings 8, and I'm hopeful that we can at least get through most of this chapter, and then we'll actually end up next Wednesday, hopefully, finishing this entire series of kings and kingdoms, at least under the united period. Uh, and then we're going to be taking a, a, a reprieve from Old Testament study for a bit. Of course, we have our topical study that's going on on Sunday mornings. And then on Wednesday nights, we're going to jump over and we're going to study the life of Christ from a new angle that we haven't done prior. You and me together, I know like, like right when we came, I think it may have been several guys, I remember Chad teaching some, and maybe some others did also, uh, the gospel according to John. And we've been here a long time. That was a long time, like 13 years ago, I think it was. Uh, that was pretty much right when we came. Well, the only gospel account we've studied together is Mark. Uh, and that's believed to be the first one that, that's written. So uh, I'm planning on uh, starting our Whenever we begin, you know, we'll have our uh, CIA slash KFC, and then the next one after that, we're going to start the gospel according to Luke. So I'm really excited about that. That's going to be uh, just a few weeks down the line. So this will be our second to last class in our series under Kings and Kingdoms. Of course, by this point, we have constructed the magnificent edifice, and now, as I've already advertised to you, we're going to be dedicating this facility, at least begin the dedication of it tonight, and then we'll finish our next class period. Verse 1 of chapter 8, if you're not already there, 1 Kings 8, first verse. Now Solomon, who of course is our king over Israel, and if you'll recall time frame wise, we're looking at about 950 B.C. 950 B.C. Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. This is a pretty important event right here, you can tell. Uh, he assembled them to himself, to King Solomon, in Jerusalem that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. And I don't know about you, but this almost sounds a little bit confusing to me, because they're taking the Ark of the Covenant away from somewhere, bringing it into where the temple is found for it to reside. Now, where is the temple located? Where has it been built? What place? What city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And we're told that they're bringing up the Ark of the Covenant from the city of David, which is Zion. That's another name for what? 
Okay, so here's what we have. The Ark of the Covenant is leaving Jerusalem to go to Jerusalem. Okay? That can sound a little bit confusing, but what it is is there's slightly more specificity with Zion as it relates to Jerusalem. Yes, Zion is used synonymously with Jerusalem, but Zion is not all of Jerusalem. You might be well aware, Jerusalem is the city of how many hills? Seven hills. Not the only city in the world that, that boasts that claim. Another big one in Bible times, New Testament times, Rome. It's another one of those uh, stated to be a city of seven hills. So there, there are a number of hills, and you know we have a song, beautiful, one of my favorites, as the mountains surround Jerusalem. The message behind that is so powerful. Uh, but the point is this, that Zion is one of those mounts in Jerusalem. We are, are moving the location of the Ark of the Covenant from Mount Zion in Jerusalem, in the city of David portion of it, and we're bringing it to another portion of the city of Jerusalem. It's being brought to a mount. And any ideas which mount this one is, where it's going to reside, where the temple, Solomon's temple, has been constructed? No? Good, good try, though. This one is uh, a name, at least, okay, a name, at least, that has some significance with a patriarch. Go sacrifice your son. On the mountains of what place? Moriah. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, Mount Moriah. And, and there's a background to this in the more recent past. Uh, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 3. And as I've uh, told you a few times here recently in our Wednesday night classes, you might just mark in Second Chronicles in this general area. We'll come back to it, maybe not this exact chapter, but we'll come back to this vicinity a few times tonight. Second Chronicles the third chapter, and this is the somewhat parallel to what we're reading here. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 3, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, the temple, in Jerusalem. Okay, so it's still Jerusalem, even though, you know, the other place was Jerusalem too. But notice, on Mount Moriah. Why does it have to be this location? Well, we're told that's where the Lord had appeared to David his father, at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Uh, Jebusite is an inhabitant of a place called Jebus. Jebus is one of the many ancient names for the city of Jerusalem. You also have uh, Salem, uh, Jerusalemu, and uh, all kinds of others. But these are just a few of them. And, and this is one of them, Jebus. Uh, do you recall this event with David? Of course, dad, is in terms of Solomon's dad, David has already passed away by now. But going back a little bit, this event involving Ornan, the Jebusite, and a sacrifice that David chose to make in, in that place. And, and he felt like it's so important that I get the sacrifice and I make it right here. Does anybody recall that event? That goes back to the numbering of the people. And David was not supposed to do that. I think he's trusting in, in the might of his army. God hasn't told him to do that. It's his own idea and Joab, you know, his, his commander, tries to stop his, his king from doing it. He basically says, hush it, son, and know your place, okay? And so he goes ahead and, and does it. And then there's this massive plague that kills tens of thousands of his people. And he's chosen this. Hey, I, I don't want to go into the hands of the enemy. Put me all day long into the hands of, of my God because I believe in him to have mercy on us. And I don't have that same kind of trust with our enemies. And so we're, we're told that the angel of the Lord appears to David in this location. Uh, you know, we know him a little bit, don't we, from the Old Testament. And David's like, whoa, this is a big deal. God himself has appeared to me in this place. And he buys this spot and he erects this altar and he, he gives these sacrifices to God. That's happened in this place and that's why... This place has been chosen as the spot where the temple will be built and the sacrifices of God will continue to take place because of the appearance of God in this location. Now, I'll also mention, and some believe this to be a different place, but it is a little bit fascinating also. When you go back to the 22nd chapter of Genesis and God calls a man to sacrifice his only child to him and he tells him, as I mentioned a moment ago, go to one of the mountains 
where I'll show you in the mountains the peaks of Moriah. I wonder, and I question if it's not the exact location where Abraham was called by God to slay his own son. But then that mysterious figure, the angel of the Lord, calls out to him and says, no, 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 don't, don't do it, don't bother. I never really wanted it, just testing you anyway. But I, I think he's putting a seed thought in everyone's mind that it's going to require a human sacrifice and a precious child to make up for the wrongs that we have done. But it can't be Abraham's child because his child has flaws. It can't be your children or my children because they're not good enough. God says, let me take care of that myself. So it could be the very spot, the exact peak on which Abraham had been told by God, don't give your kid, no, I'll take care of it. And then later, we find out uh, about Jesus, one of the hills of Jerusalem, okay, that he gets offered as a sacrifice, of course, that one being Calvary. Pretty interesting stuff. So say that to, uh, say this, going back to our text, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1. All this is in the city of Jerusalem. But the ark is taken out of, or off of one mountain uh, in terms of Zion, and it's moved to, of course, Moriah, uh, where the temple has been constructed. Uh, James Smith, he mentions in his commentary on this passage, he says, because it housed the sacred ark, the newly built temple enjoyed the sanctity and national prestige of the sanctuary in Shiloh. Remember when the tabernacle was located in the city of Shiloh for a long time? which had been destroyed by the Philistines about 145 years earlier. And that goes back to, check me on it, but I want to say about chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, and that's practically where we began this study long ago. So it's pretty neat, like you study a book of, say like Genesis, and in 50 chapters you cover like 1,500 years. Enormous, the span of scope. One book. Here we are covering a good chunk of six very large books, and we've made it through about 145 years of history. <laughs> so you see there's so much that's packed into this compared to some others. But that goes back to early where we began, when it was at Shiloh, the uh, tabernacle, the tent, not a house, but the tent was found there, the worship facility, quote unquote. Uh, that's when the Philistines came in, and they destroyed that place, and again, that's about 150 years prior. So now we have a house that has foundations that's been constructed. And the ark is finally going to come into a resting spot, a holy of holies once again. Because it hasn't been in one of those in a very long time. Verse 2. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. How many major feasts of the Jews? Three major feasts. Uh, what are those major feasts? They all had to present themselves, the, the males. Very good. Okay, that's where it begins. And also kind of bleeds over into the Feast uh, of Weeks, right? Okay, we have that. And then those uh, weeks going down, what do we have? Very good. Excellent, Scott. Yeah, you're, you're on to something. Yeah, hang on to that, okay? And so in, in the first month, uh, you have uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay? And then in the third month, all significant Bible numbers, in the third month, or about 50 days down the road, what's well, a really important one of the Jews? There you go, Acts, the second chapter, okay? Five or 50 after, all right? And then in the seventh month, Scott, excellent. This is the one that doesn't get as much limelight. <laughs> this is the Feast of Booze or... Sometimes you read as tabernacles, tents, is what that means. And it's a commemoration of the time that the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they didn't have houses in which to live for some time. They had to stay in tents. And so, you know, it reminds them of that. So, this is the seventh month when all the men of Israel assemble with King Solomon. It seems to make a lot of sense that apparently the Feast of Booze or Tabernacles is about to ensue. Verse 3, so all the elders of Israel came and the priests took up the ark. This is a little bit different from what we ordinarily find as, as far as the proper way of doing things. Who usually carries around the ark? The ark of the covenant. 
Okay, very good. The Levites, and, and not like the Aaronic side. Well, the Aaronic, yes. Uh, but, but not through the descendancy of, of the priests themselves proper, right? But they have other temple and, and before tabernacle work that needs to be done. So it's kind of a strange event that priests are carrying this thing. Usually it's the Levites that do so, but that's instruction that they've been given. Turn back to Joshua chapter 3. I want to look quickly in this book of a couple of instances we find when there's this, uh, you know, kind of moving instruction put in place uh, as far as different people are supposed to do this. Joshua 3, and we'll look there in verses 6 and 7. Joshua 3, 6 and 7. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant. This isn't usually their job. I want you to take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel so that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I also be with you. And I know we haven't read it and I don't want to take the time to do it. Joshua 3, what major events going on here? Bingo, that's it, Marty. They're crossing the Jordan River. They only have one issue. The Jordan River, which is you know, not too large of a stream, right now is in spring flood stage. <laughs> it's rolling, and there's no one who's safely going to be able to go across this stream. Uh, we know in the Ozarks, unfortunately, just you know, uh, normally dry stream beds, when they get to rolling and you get a vehicle on those, uh, you don't even try yourself, but if you put a vehicle on it, you get swept away. Well, I mean, this is a body of water, a rolling body of water anyway, and it is flooded. It is really moving. But God has a solution. He tells the priest, I want you, this is special instruction, to pick up, uh, of course, by the poles, we understand. I want you to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and step into the, the swollen stream. And we're told that as soon as the soles of their feet struck the water carrying that Ark, what happened? peeled back. A flooded stream went 20, about 20 miles the waters did upstream. You know the force of water. <laughs> Nothing compared to the force of the creator of water. The Ark of the Covenant symbolizes the presence of God. And he gets these priests involved in special instruction to carry it and an incredible thing occurs. One other instance of this over in chapter 6. In chapter 6 we'll also read verses 6 and 7. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city. Let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. This isn't any ordinary carrying. We're going to have the Levites kind of you know, go to the side for a minute. Let's get the priest. We get the priest to pick up the Ark and circle the city. And what happens? <laughs> Walls come crumbling down. When the priests get involved in carrying the Ark of God, there, there's something significant that's taking place. So in 1 Kings chapter 8, we're told in verse 3, so all the elders of Israel came. It's not the Levites like it's normally done. The priests pick up the Ark. This is a, a big event in Israelite history. Verse 4, then they brought up the Ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, or the tent of, well, they have a house with fixture. What do, what do they care about the tent anymore? The old meeting place. Well, we have a new house of meeting. Guess what? We, we still find some use, don't we? <laughs> and so it, they say, hey, let's, let's bring up the ark. Of, not that only. Let's bring up the tabernacle of meeting. And I, th I think especially for this reason. And all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. Do you remember the three major parts of the uh, Old Testament worship tent, three major sections of the tabernacle, what were they? The outer court, that's where people gather to worship, right? What else? Okay, and then what else? All right, so now things are completely different because we have the house with, with fixtures, the temple, and what components are found there? The outer court where the people gather to worship, the holy place. Oh, well, it's like exactly the same, it's just... So, I mean, there's not a lot of difference. And the same thing's true with the furnishings uh, of the temple. You know, a lot of those uh, pieces, you know, the lampstands, and, of course, you have the showbread and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's going to be used in this facility as well. The priest and the Levites, see, they still have a role in this, the Levites. Uh, they work to bring up 
all of that stuff. Verse 5, also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with them uh, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. So all of these before the, the ark of the Lord are making all these sacrifices. You think they've learned something from history? Oh, what happened? I mean, it's a little ways back. What do we have about 2 Samuel 6? Check me on that. Uh, but about 2 Samuel 6, David tries transporting the ark. It's one of those things when he doesn't do it exactly the way God told him to do it. And he tries doing it his own way instead. And that results in, in the death of a human being and everybody else being petrified. Not really wanting to have anything to do with it. And so they, they kind of leave things alone for a few days and figure out, okay, well, it doesn't seem like the Lord's going to kill us all. <laughs> but this time, they deal with things a little more respectfully. They go about things God's way. They transport it His way, not by carrying it on a, a cart that's being pulled by oxen, but as He instructed with the Levites and the poles and carrying it around. Only this time, you remember every few steps, what did they stop and do? offered sacrifices to their God. The first time they seemed to go about it a little flippantly, like it's no big deal. Well, now they know it's a big deal when you're carrying the presence of God around. They're showing all this respect. I, I think that Solomon's probably learned from Dad where he, all the congregation of Israel assembled with him or with him before the ark and they are sacrificing animals dealing with this ark <laughs> left and right. Sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place. Uh, what is this place going to be? Well, we're told in the next little section here. Into the inner sanctuary of the temple. Uh, sanctuary just basically means what? Kind of like to be sanctified means to be set apart or, or holy. So if you have a, a sanctuary, you're talking about a place, and so it's what kind of a place? That's a holy place, but this one's different. It's the inner holy place. <laughs> uh, or, or in other words, it's, it's the holiest, the holy of holy. So they bring it into the most holy place, uh, as we're told in the very next phrase, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim, you recall the positioning. There, there are two of them. Cherub is singular. Cherubim is plural. It's not cherubims. It's not cherubs. It's, it's cherubim. That's the, the pluralization of that from Hebrew. And they, they kind of swoop over their wings, and they create somewhat of a, a shadow underneath, and I think this is probably from where the idea comes, uh, underneath the shadow of his wings, and we have that in some of our songs. Well, this represents the presence of God and, and being found underneath the shadow, the protection of his wings. And the cherubim overshadowed, there's that concept, the ark, and as well its poles. I find this interesting. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place, so the other section, in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they're there to this day. So when they're positioned and put in, they're just left inside of those golden rings, uh, so they can be lifted and, and transported easily, if, I guess, if need be. Verse 9, this is neat too. Nothing was inside the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, or Sinai, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So when God gave the Ten Commandments, there are those stones. Of course, Moses breaks the first ones and has to get the others, and but the handwriting of God is found on those second ones also. But what we read here is by the time the temple worship facility comes around, there is nothing inside of the Ark of the Covenant except for the two tablets. That's different from before. What used to be inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, sir. Excellent. And since you've perfectly spoken the words, we're not going to turn to and read Hebrews 9.4. <laughs> we're, we're reminded, of course we're told in the Old Testament also, that under the tent worship, the original one, you had not only the tablets of, of law, but as well as Marty said, a golden, a golden pot that contained manna. And that's the original stuff. That's what came down and what God used to feed his people. And it was put inside and it was preserved and never decayed inside of that. And then you also had 
what should have been a dead piece of wood is just constantly sprouting life. Life never... So I, I think it has some symbolism in, involved. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. I'm, I kind of wonder if it's a little more the judgment of God itself. It's a possibility. Uh, but for sure, the presence of God, we know that much. And then we have his law that's placed within there. And so long as you have the presence of God and his law, his will being found, you will never decay and you will always have life. I think are the two concepts uh, behind those. And, okay, good, good question. I'm getting there. Yeah, no, 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 I'm, and I'm glad, because I might have forgotten, honestly. I was about to move on, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Marty asked if, if you didn't hear, what happened to the other pieces? <laughs> all right, so let, let's talk about this moment. It's not really my purpose to go through and to, try to identify all these tonight. I would love to do it, but you, you would be on this forever if you did so. Uh, in the textual studies, I like to deal more with the text, and as time allows, making application. And I, what I'd like to do is have a topical study on this once we get pretty familiar through the text. And then we can go back and try to identify what every one of these pieces mean for the church age today. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but this one I, I want to say too, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure, but what the Ark of the Covenant itself doesn't represent even more so, the judgment of God. And here's why. We know that when it's all said and done, what's going to be brought out by which we'll all be judged? Jesus himself spoke it. Uh, you can listen to me and reject what I say. That's your choice. But he says, what? The, the words that I have spoken will judge him at the, at the last day. And when John in, in Revelation chapter 20 says, I saw the, the tremendous judgment scene unfolding before my eyes. And he says, all the dead, small and great, were standing before him. And all those who had died in any way and had been buried in any place or hadn't been buried at all. They were all found there. He said, books, plural, were open. And they were judged according by their, uh, to their works by the things which were written in those books. What do you think the plurality of books is that are found there? Do you think when it comes our time, the law of Moses is going to be opened up? All right, how many sacrifices did you give? How many Sabbaths did you observe? We, we didn't live under that system. No, we're going to be judged, as Jesus said, by the words he has spoken. But the people of our time are not going to be judged by our law. They lived under a different system. System. Okay, so how many church services did you attend? How many kind deeds did you do for you know, widows and orphans? And, uh, and, and there's some of those things that are similarities in both laws, but there are some specifics that are different. It seems that the two laws that are open are the two major different laws under which people have lived. And, and really there it's, it's books, plural. And then you have a system for about 2,500 years that even antedates the law of Moses, which is you know, Romans chapter 2, a law unto themselves. That makes a lot of sense. And then it mentions, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And then it's, is your name found in that place? And, and the two of those go hand in hand together. So point being this, though. Going back to the Ark of the Covenant, and you have the presence of God symbolized. Uh, you know, when cherubim are found in Scripture, God is, is there. And so you have the cherubim, and, and you have God symbolized by these cherubim, his presence anyway, uh, overshadowing this judgment that's found, a judgment that takes place by the law. And inside, inside of that, uh, you have a, a branch that sprouts out life. I, I don't want to get ahead, but on uh, for Sunday, I ask you to store that away if you're going to be with us on Sunday in the sermon, in a prophecy that's made in, in the book of Zechariah, in the third chapter. There's someone who's, who's called the branch that God's going to send. <laughs> and so you have this branch that issues, that sprouts forth life. And then you also have this golden pot signifying its, its precious worth. And on the inside, bread that never dies. Or in other words, bread of life. And so God has law upon which judgment is based. But thank God that there's something precious called the bread of life when we're dead to help us out. And there's the branch that sprouts life to give us such when otherwise we would desperately need it. And so you have all this, and the one thing, other thing I want to mention before we move on is you have uh, these cherubim, the presence of God and his judgment, but on top of, positioned on top, what's that? I know we haven't really encountered it here. What's put on, on top of all that judgment or, or that ark of God? The 
mercy seat. You remember what the Holy Spirit tells us in James 2, verse 13? He says, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But of course, as, as Jesus has promised to us, blessed are the merciful. What? They shall obtain mercy. So judgment is without mercy if you haven't shown mercy. But he goes on to say, if, it's good if you're a merciful person. That's what God calls us to be. Because that's when mercy triumphs over or sits on top of judgment that's based on the law. And so I think you have all of this symbolized in the Ark of, of the Covenant, the judgment of God that's going to be by his law, and the chance for us to have life, even though the law just condemns us to die, because of the branch and the bread of life that are found within, and God's presence located, but over the top of it all, why do we have the chance of life that never ends? Because mercy, the mercy of God sits on top of and it triumphs over judgment, over law. Anyway, I didn't plan on getting into that, but I just love that so much. I wanted to bring that out before we move on. So we're in verse 9. Okay, I can't forget, Marty. Thank you. Marty asked this, where do the things go? Okay, give me just a second here. <laughs> uh, keep your spot. Turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 5. Now this is also near the start of our original study where it began. 1 Samuel chapter 5. All of this was put in the original Ark of the Covenant. I mean, it's the same Ark of the Covenant, but I, what I mean is it, and it's an original setup and it's resting place in the tabernacle. Here's where I think things probably change, even though we're not specifically told. 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They take it into their house, Dagon, and, and, and their god, Dagon, is found... The statue's fallen over each morning, bowing down before the Ark of the Covenant. They're like, okay, by the way, what was it, the like third time or something? Something's not right right here. And so they send it on to another city, and, and there are uh, these tumors that break out on the people. They send it to another Philistine city, and this plague that breaks out among them. And finally, they're like, okay, we beat you guys, but we don't want this thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. And so they, they send it back to Israel. Now, uh, it's possible that those things could have been taken out. And that may be why God plagued them so heavily, if they would have uh, obtained those things out of the ark. Uh, another possibility, I didn't mean to close my spot. Turn to, uh, and you might need, not even need to, chapter 6 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 6 and verse 19. Uh, this is when the ark comes back, as you might see as a heading there in your Bible. The ark's returned by the Philistines to the Israelites. And verse 19, it stated, he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh. That's, that's his own people. That's Israelites. Because they didn't deal with the ark the way they should have, out of profound respect. They looked upon the ark of the Lord. And uh, he struck 70 of them. And uh, that's the ESV. Uh, you see the Hebrew here it mentions 70 men, 50,000 men. A difference in... But, Regardless, a whole bunch of people, and the people mourn because the Lord has struck the people with a great blow. I, I would sure like to think it, it wouldn't be the Israelites that tried to alter any of that, but to me it would make a lot of sense that the Philistines probably did or tried to do something uh, with it. Regardless, we're not directly told, but we do know by this point all the same elements aren't found there. Whatever it was that happened to them, that seems to be the best guess, though. So that's in uh, verse 9 we've covered in, in our text of 1 Kings 8. So 10. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. What's the significance of this cloud? That's, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I missed it again, I'm sorry. Okay. Right, gotcha, yeah. Shekinah is what you're saying? Is that, gotcha, yeah. And so this is a manifestation of God's presence under the Old Testament. It goes back to the tabernacle also. Do you recall when it's constructed and it's you know, officially dedicated for worship in uh, chapter 40, the last one of Exodus, and, and the cloud comes over. And, and also you have the cloud, of course, that leads the people uh, through the day and then the fire that leads them at night. So, yeah, this is the, the presence of the Lord. So the cloud fills the house of the Lord, verse 11, the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord 
filled the house of the Lord. And that's when Solomon opens his mouth and begins to speak. The king spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in this dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. And the king does this. Great politicians do. He gives this magnificent speech, and I'm not sliding him in saying that. He's, he's a genuine guy and a true servant of the Lord, and, and I have no doubt that every word that he spoke was completely heartfelt this day. Then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who spoke with his mouth to my father David, and with his hand has fulfilled it, saying, since the day that I brought my people out of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I chose David, David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of my father David, Solomon speaking, to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. It was a good thought. Nevertheless... You shall not build the temple. <laughs> it's one of those things like, oh, you're so sweet. No. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I, I appreciate the gesture. But he says, your son, who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So Solomon says, the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke. And I, I appreciate what Solomon, I, I, I sense, is trying to do here. And that's to maybe take attention off of himself. Um, and also... Maybe if, if anyone thinks, oh, this guy, you know, he's wanting all this credit from, he's saying, it was never my idea, okay? This was God's plan all along. God said, I should do this, and that's the only reason that I've done this. And I think he's, he's placing himself below um, the Lord and the assembly so they respect God and, and, and don't look at the king the wrong way. Verse 20, so the Lord's fulfilled this word. He says, I filled the position of my father David. I'm king now. And sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I've made a place for the ark. That's, you know, why for all this procession. It finally has a resting place for the first time in 145 years, roughly. And there I've made this place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, the Ten Commandments themselves, the tablets of stone, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So now we're going to shift from a, a tremendous speech that's given uh, just to an absolutely beautiful prayer. Verse 22, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of the Lord and, and spread out his hands to heaven. And this is one of those, if you don't care, just probably this last time that we'll have time. Uh, go back to 2 Chronicles, this time chapter 6. So if you marked it, I think we're in 3, not too far from where we were. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, uh, yet again, gives a little bit more information into this. Uh, looking back at, at verse 12, 2 Chronicles 6. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. We know that, we've already read it. But this parallel account gives us this piece of, of information. Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long... Okay, good. Five cu or, yeah, so seven and a half feet long, five cubits wide. Okay, so that makes it easy. Seven and a half feet. And three cubits high. That's always the more challenging one. Very good. Four and a half that, that stands up. And so basically, it's, it's a, there's a stage is what it is, which is, you know, we, we do that with all of our stuff. So, you know, voices project better and that kind of thing. Uh, but we're told here that he had it set in the court and he stood on it. This is powerful. But after that, he fell on his knees. He knelt on his knees, this platform. You have to understand, if, if you're a, the most powerful ruler in a country, you don't get on your knees in front of anyone. They do that before you. And in the presence of this crowd that's standing, he gets on his knees on a platform so everyone can look on. And he spread out his hands toward heaven. And then he goes through this tremendous prayer. And, and there's no reason for us to read it twice, but... I wanted to go over there because that's a, a neat tidbit that we wouldn't find where we are in, second, in First Kings. So First Kings, he spreads out his hands toward heaven, but he's on his knees as he does so. 
And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God, this is back in 23 of 1 Kings 8, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you. And he's not saying by that that there are other gods, <laughs> in addition to two. There are people who are going to perceive other gods, but he's saying essentially there's no real God but you. You keep your covenant and your mercy. Remember that mercy seat that overshadows everything. With your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. You know that old song, give me the Bible and law and love combining. It's not love only, but thank God it's not law only either. <laughs> it's law and love combining. And so you see how the mercy of God works it's given to those who walk before you with all their hearts. Now, if you do everything right according to law, you don't need mercy. But it's important that we give our all to do what God expects out of us. And then when we still fall short in those expectations, there's limitless mercy. Psalm 103, uh, David being the writer, says it's, it's from everlasting to everlasting, the mercy of God to those who fear him. Verse 24, you have kept what you promised your servant David, my father. You have both spoken with your mouth and fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised your servant David, my father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel only if your sons take heed to their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. David did not walk perfectly <laughs> before God. <laughs> what a beautiful story of, of hope I feel like that is to us also. You know, the guy who says, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, spoke from personal experience. I, I know, and we can know and have that also. It's not all going to be perfect. But God is so kind and so good. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, now keep what you promised. Oh, I already read that one, sorry. Verse 26. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. Okay, who wants to say our memory verse? And we'll go just a little further before we conclude. 1 Kings 8, 27. Roy's not here to bail me out tonight. So. 1 Kings 8, 27. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven of the heavens cannot contain you how much less this temple which I have built. So when we're talking about, hey, the glory of God comes down and fills the, the tabernacle, this is not actually like, like the literal presence of God. <laughs> because as, as Solomon states, you can't take all of God and, and contain it in this, this little tiny you know, physical. <laughs> no, he, he says, all of the heavens cannot contain your full. God is everywhere. <laughs> presence of God is that that's he is he is omnipresent but what he's saying is of course that the manifestation of the glory of God is going to be found in this place yet regard he says nevertheless the prayer of your servant and the supplication O Lord my God listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day and toward the place of which you said my name shall be there and that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place. And may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Prayer tends to be directed toward the temple. Not done in the temple, but directed toward it, the worship. Here in heaven, your dwelling place. Okay, so that's where God actually lives. God's not going to literally live inside of a, of a physical box on planet Earth. But where he actually lives is in heaven above. Here, and when you hear, God, we need you to forgive us. When anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, hear in heaven and act, judge your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they've sinned against you, when they turn back to you and confess your name, and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them back to the land which you gave to your fathers. Now, there's plenty more in this prayer, and uh, I'm going to just stop right there. We'll cover the rest of it the next time we get together. Um, if you don't mind, go ahead and, and read. If you have, please reread uh, the ending of chapter 8 
and then the plan is also to go through just the first nine verses of 1 Kings 9, and then we're done with this series, which I know looks kind of strange because it's like, that's midway of a chapter, midway of a book. Well, that's just about where the United Kingdom period ends. <laughs> and so that's why we're going to cut it off in that spot. But please read those, uh, if you will. And as far as a memory verse, I'll, I'll get that to you. Sorry, I'd, I, um, let's do, I tell you what, let's do, uh, no, verse 8, that's the one. Okay, chapter 9, verse 8, I did pick that out. Yeah, okay. So in chapter 9, verse 8, that'll be our final one of, of this series. But any other comments through where we've been tonight? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, mm, absolutely. <sighs> okay. Uh, no, you're right, 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 no. So, uh, right, right, I don't believe so. And, and let me double check, okay? But I don't, I don't believe it was in the, uh, the destruction. Yeah, l let me check, though. I don't even want to get off base there. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be, it's going to be at the second one uh, when, uh, yeah, let me, let me come back to you. Okay, yeah. But I, I appreciate the question. I just want to make sure. It's been a while since I looked into it. All right, any other thoughts, questions before we conclude tonight? Okay, thank you. So 1 Kings 9, 8, last class period, next time. Appreciate it.